Hi, this is Tamina Park, Instructional Design Podcast. Thanks for joining me on my very first podcast episode. I wanted to spend some time this episode expanding on a topic that I very briefly covered in my video called The Metaphysical Poets Part 2, which hopefully you've already seen, but if not, I'll include a link to that. And a topic that I mentioned in that video is conceit which I defined as an extended metaphor whose pairing of ideas is often unconventional and even at times esoteric. Now, in a prior video on metaphysical poetry, I mentioned that Samuel Johnson was the one who actually gave the metaphysical poets their name, and he did not intend that as a compliment. And so he described metaphysical conceit as follows. Quote, The most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. Nature and art are ransacked for illustrations, comparisons, and allusions. To be fair, once conceit uh, took off as a concept um, during this era of poetry, it quickly became overused and uh, overwrought and fell out of fashion pretty fast. So... Johnson wasn't completely wrong about his judgment of metaphysical poets, but it is the device that's most commonly associated with that genre of poetry, and so I thought it deserved a closer look. And it's also a great way to get a better idea of the concerns and the the interests of the poets at that time. So by far the most celebrated practitioner of conceit was John Donne, who we also looked at in that uh, part two video. Um, In that video, we looked at the poem, Hymn to God, My God, in My Sickness. And that's where he used conceit to compare his own body that was sick at the time, lying prone on an examining table, and compared that to a map that the doctors would use to trace his illness. And so through that conceit, you can see the, the sort of outsized role of exploration that persisted late into the Renaissance. And it also makes specific allusion to Magellan's discovery of a navigable sea route from the Atlantic to Pacific Ocean in 1520, which was eventually called the Strait of Magellan. So Hymn to God was written pretty late in Dunn's life um, in the 1620s or possibly in 1631, which was uh, the year that he died. And by this point, he had been a prominent cleric in the Anglican Church, and he wrote lots of poems on religious themes, including Hymn to God. And that's very much in contrast to his earlier works, which included a lot of religious reflection, but a lot of it was also dedicated to more romantic or even sexual topics. And because of this, uh, the young Dunn earned a kind of reputation as a libertine, or what we might call today a player. But you could actually see a very romantic side in his poems as well. And even in life, he apparently sabotaged a promising career in politics by marrying his boss's daughter. So he had some romantic elements to him. Um, We're going to look at a poem, though, called Woman's Constancy. And like a lot of his poems, there isn't a clear date because most of his poetry was just circulated amongst his friends and peers and published posthumously. But this one was probably written around the 1590s when uh, Dunn was uh, maybe in his early 20s. And I'll include the full poem in the show notes so that you can have a look at it as well. So let's have a look at the poem by first setting the scene. In this poem, the speaker is with his lover, having spent the whole day together, and they are perhaps lying in bed. It's the end of the day, and this is the the speaker speaking directly to his lover. So here's the poem itself. Now thou hast loved me one whole day. Tomorrow, when you leavest, what wilt thou say? Wilt thou then antedate some new-made vow? Or say that now we are not just those persons which we were? Or that oaths made in reverential fear of love and his wrath any may forswear? Or as true deaths, true marriages untie, so lovers' contracts, 
images of those bind but till sleep, death's image, them unloose. Or your own end to justify, for having purposed change and falsehood, you can have no way but falsehood to be true. Vain lunatic, against these scapes I would dispute and conquer if I would, which I abstain to do, for by tomorrow I may think so too. So that's the poem. And you can see the conceit here is between the lover's vows, the vows to be faithful and to stay committed in the relationship, and the language of a legal contract. And it might be helpful to know that Dunn himself was a legal student, a legal scholar. He became a student at the Inns of Chancery in 1591 and then joined the Inns of Court in 1592, which is the Association of Barristers in England and Wales, barristers being a kind of lawyer for common law. Um, and so he would have been really familiar with these kinds of scholarly exercises when you puzzle out uh, a legal dispute and like how to get out or in of uh, into loopholes. The speaker in this poem accuses his lover of using, or at least planning to use, legal manipulation to talk herself out of commitment in the relationship. So you see, for instance, in line three, he says, Wilt thou then antedate some new made vow? Will you create this new contract in the relationship saying it was only meant to be for a day and then antedate it, so backdate it so that it sounds like you made this promise earlier, right? Or further on in the middle of the poem, he says, or as true deaths, true marriages untie, so lovers' contracts, images of those bind but till sleep, death's image, them unloose. It's a, kind of a complicated sentence structure, but he's calling lovers' contracts a kind of an image of a marriage contract. So not quite the same thing, but similar. And so just as those two things are similar, death, which was considered to cancel a marriage contract, is similar to sleep. And so maybe tonight they'll go to sleep, and because of that they'll wake up in the morning and this contract between them, the lovers, will be broken. It will no longer be valid. And so you see all of this language of uh, legal promises and contracts that is uh, very much an indication of the preoccupation in Elizabethan England at the time with the, the shift that was happening in the institution of marriage. Because it was moving away from this medieval notion of troth, right, this verbal pledge that you would make with one another, into a more legally binding relationship. And so you would see an increasing use of marriage contracts between uh, middle and upper class families. And a lot of that preoccupation shows up in literature of the time as well as this poem. You can also read it as a very misogynistic view of woman, right? After all, Don was living in a man's world and he calls this poem woman's constancy which almost seems like this sarcastic, ironic uh, take on um, the faithfulness of his lover, which apparently amounts to no more than a day, according to the speaker. But if you view it another way, I think maybe it's not quite as misogynistic as that first seems, because at the very end of the poem, um, I'm just going to read the last four lines again, vain lunatic, calling himself, I think, a vain lunatic, Against these scapes, I could dispute and conquer if I would. So I could, if I wanted to, fight against this and win. Again, making it sound like it's a legal uh, conflict, that you would go to court to hash these things out. But then he says, which I abstain to do. And why? For by tomorrow, I may think so too. So within the same poem, by the very end, he condemns himself as being potentially just as inconstant as his lover. And this, I think, also speaks to a, a kind of new social reality at the time, one that we certainly can relate to of relationships that just last maybe a day, maybe not even that, 
right? This whole uh, world that we're living in now with online dating and hookup culture is something that even Don was experiencing in his time. Um, there's another reading of a poem that I came across of all places in a legal journal by a writer named David J. Perlman. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the notes as well, because I think it's a really interesting take on the poem. And he argues that the speaker, in fact, is the woman in the relationship and that she's using uh, or accusing her lover of using a legal language and loopholes because that was the, the law was considered to be the purview of men at the time. And her constancy is being contrasted against the lover's lack of constancy, that he's using the law to get himself out of this relationship. So I think it's a really uh, interesting take and one that I hadn't considered at all when I first read it. I had assumed that it was from a more a male perspective, given that I think the majority of Dunn's poems are from the man's perspective. But I think it's an equally valid reading and it really introduces um, a new twist on it. So to just go over the keys to conceit itself, it's a longer version of a metaphor. You can see in this poem, it extends all the way through the entire poem. And unlike a metaphor, it includes this desire or willingness to really investigate the full possibilities of the comparison. And I think it accomplishes what some of the best metaphors can also do, which is let us into the, the speaker's state of mind and gauge kind of the tenor of their mood and their words. So in this poem, uh, Woman's Constancy, you can see how this language of law, this cool, impartial language, is used to reflect the coldness that the speaker anticipates from the lover, as well as the coldness that the speaker themselves might eventually feel. Right, it's all part of that same attitude. So I hope this discussion was informative, gives you some ideas about conceit that you can apply to other poems, whether metaphysical or otherwise. There are plenty of other poems out there from other eras um, that also use conceit. Uh, if, in fact, you want a more recent example of conceit in poetry, I suggest you check out the poem Diving into the Wreck by Adrian Rich. I'll include a link to that as well. Otherwise, that's it. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>